The Reformed Faith of John Calvin, The Institutes in Summary, by Professor David J. Engelsma. That's the book we're discussing now with the author. Published in 2009 by the Reformed Free Publishing Association. Professor Engelsma, you say that this book is the Institutes in Summary. That means that it's not not an abbreviation or an abridgment. What do you mean by a summary? Your analysis is correct. Deliberately, the book is subtitled The Institutes in Summary. Some years ago, when I was teaching at the Protestant Reform Seminary, including the subject of dogmatics or systematic theology, I gave a course in Calvin's Institutes. And it came to my attention when I was preparing for this course and for teaching this course, that although there are any number of abridgments of the Institutes, there is, so far as I knew at that time, and so far as I know still today, no summary of the Institutes. The abridgment, of course, is the selection of parts from the Institutes and the exclusion of other parts of the Institutes and then publishing whichever parts of the Institutes one has chosen. This summary, in distinction from an abridgment, is my own expression of what Calvin teaches in all of the main parts of his Institutes. The various books in the Institutes and each of the main subdivisions of each of the books of the Institutes. I express for the contemporary reader what Calvin in the Institutes teaches about all of the doctrines of the Christian faith in the order in which Calvin treats them. But then in connection with the summary I make, my own expression of the essential teaching of Calvin in each part, I give not carefully selected quotations, but essential, essential quotations to verify that my summarizing of Calvin is faithful to what Calvin himself was teaching. That explains the subtitle, The Institutes in Summary. You also make application of Calvin's teaching to today in appropriate places. I think that adds to the value of the book. That's correct. There are various theological and practical issues in the Christian churches today, especially in churches that are Calvinistic or Reformed. Controversies, in fact, and throughout the book, after I have summarized Calvin's teaching, I will apply Calvin's own teaching to these controversies and show by Calvin's own teaching which of the positions is the right one and which of the positions is the wrong one, the heretical one. Now, some of our viewers may have noticed when I gave the bibliographical details the significant year 2009. That's the 450th anniversary of the final version of the Institutes and the 500th anniversary of the Reformers' birth in 1509. That's significant? Yes, it is. The book was deliberately published to celebrate those momentous dates for the Reformed churches in the world. And do 
did you feel you were able to get the job done in sufficient time and that you weren't skimming the odd chapter, giving it a cursory treatment because of deadlines? I started the book early enough so that I think on the title page or near the title page I could correctly put the date 2009. I finished it in time. And the book is intended to celebrate both the life and especially the work of John Calvin. Yes, you mentioned the life as well as the summary. There's an introductory section dealing with the man and his life, Calvin, the nature of the institutes, its role as an apology for the Reformed faith to Francis I of France, for instance, the history of the publishing, the style and structure of the institutes and an analysis of the prefatory address comes to some 60 pages. You felt that was worthwhile material, helpful? I wanted this book to be as thorough a presentation of the institutes as was possible in one manageable volume. I had to guard against the threat to which Calvin himself succumbed. He was going to write originally a very brief treatise on the Christian faith. Ooh. It started out that way, but ended in 1559 in two large volumes. And that could have happened with this volume too, but I guarded against that. But at the same time, I wanted the book to be as thorough an explanation of the institutes of the Christian religion as it possibly could be in one volume of this size. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, Calvin's great work, is a monumental work and recognized as a monumental work not only for Reformed Christianity but for Christianity per se, even though much of nominal Christianity today repudiates Calvin's teaching of the Christian religion. And I wanted the reader to know something about Calvin's life as well. I have to confess that I felt most embarrassed about that part of the book because so much more could have been said about the life and the work of Calvin. But I wanted to keep that brief. There are other biographies of Calvin that can be read for his life. But I have the main features and the drift of his life and the significance of various times in his life for his work included in this volume. And then as you point out, before I get into the content of the Institutes, I say something about the form of it, how he divided it, the style of his writing, universally recognized by the way as a glorious style. Some say that he was one of the major uh, influences upon the French language in which he originally wrote the Institutes formed the French language into the language that it became, which indicates again the, the gifts of that man, the greatness of that man, and some other aspects also of the actual form of the Institutes, including the preface which was significantly addressed to King Francis I of France, who was persecuting Calvin's fellow countrymen. Calvin was a Frenchman, undoubtedly the greatest Frenchman that France has ever produced, but chased out of his country by the persecuting French Roman Catholics or Roman Catholic-influenced civil authorities. So that although he spent the rest of his life, most of the rest of his life in Geneva, Switzerland, he nevertheless had a heart for France and for the people of France. And he wrote the preface to the book to France to explain the Christian religion, to explain the Reformed Christian religion to Francis, so as if possible to put an end to the persecution of Calvin's countrymen in France. Now in your book you then proceed to work your way through the four books of Calvin's Institutes. Book one, 
the knowledge of God the Creator. Book 2, the knowledge of God the Redeemer in Christ. Book 3, the way in which we receive the grace of Christ. You could summarize it as a treatment of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then book 4, on the external means or aids by which God invites us into the society of Christ and holds us therein. The Church. You are a theologian dealing with the theology of John Calvin. Are there any parts of Calvin's theology that you particularly enjoy, find helpful, and reckon that the world needs to hear this truth today? If I may say one more word about the format of the book before I take up that intriguing question. The book is a summary of Kelvin's doctrine in the Institutes that follows Kelvin's own format in the Institutes. That is, explains the doctrines of the Christian religion in a certain order. And in connection with every section of the summary, there are references to the uh, authoritative edition of the Institutes itself so that the reader at any point is able to check easily my summary against Calvin's own words in the Institutes. If some reader somewhere for some strange reason doubts the accuracy of my summary, I make it easy for him to check the original and find fault with my summary if he is inclined to do that. It's intended, uh, the book is intended to give Calvin's teaching the essence of the Reformed religion, which is in fact genuine Christianity, not only to the layman who is not going to pick up those two volumes of the Institutes very likely and read them himself, but also for many pastors who either don't have the time or the inclination to read the entire Institutes, but would like to know what the Institutes teaches. That's specifically the audience at which the book is aimed. But now to come to your question about sections in the Institutes that I think are especially important. I would say that undoubtedly chief among the sections of the Institutes, especially in light of the controversy over the doctrine and in light of the widespread departure from the truth of the doctrine, would be Calvin's treatment of predestination, election, and reprobation. As all the Christian world recognizes, Calvin was influential in developing and systematizing what the Bible teaches concerning God's predestination of mankind. That doctrine is offensive to many, and the doctrine, of uh, the doctrine of predestination is being grossly misrepresented by many Reformed and Presbyterian theologians, including Karl Barth, who at least had the honesty at the outset of his treatment of predestination to remark with sorrow that he had to depart from Calvin. I appreciate that kind of honesty. The other theologians are deceptive and would like the public to believe that what they are teaching about predestination is faithful to Calvin when, as this summary will make crystal clear, they are contradicting Calvin's doctrine of predestination. But apart from the controversy, the doctrine of predestination is in fact fundamental to the salvation of God in Jesus Christ. The summary of Calvin's doctrine of predestination is found in the book, and uh, 
the summary's explanation, not only of what Calvin taught, but how he approached the doctrine and how he developed the doctrine are of special interest to me and I would think to all who call themselves Reformed. Striking in that connection is that although later Reformed theologians treat predestination at the beginning of their dogmatics, in the first head of their doctrine, Calvin does not treat predestination until after he has treated the doctrine of salvation. And that's not because Calvin minimized predestination. He taught that predestination is the cause and source of all salvation in Jesus Christ, but he placed it after his treatment of the doctrine of salvation because in that way he wanted to show that the fountain or source of all salvation is God's predestination, particularly God's election of his people in Christ. Another feature of Calvin's doctrine of predestination that's worthy of note is that already at that time, back in the 1550s, Calvin was insistent that God's election of his people unto salvation that aspect of predestination was a decision that God made in Jesus Christ that was important to Calvin, and he emphasized that. All of our salvation is in Jesus Christ, not just our redemption in the cross or our regeneration by the Spirit of Christ, but also the origin of our salvation, which implies, if Calvin does not make that assertion, that in God's eternal decree of election, God chose Jesus Christ first, as is also the teaching of Colossians chapter 1, and chose us only in Christ and for Christ's sake. So I would say that, that section of the Institutes was and is of special interest to me, and I worked hard to do justice not to what I think about predestination, but what Kelvin actually taught about predestination. The themes you've drawn from the books, including Union with Christ, to which you devote 20 pages, the personal work of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the Christian life, prayer, civil government, the final resurrection, very beautiful, glorious, subjects, but it would also be true to say that you don't agree with everything in the Institutes. You have some criticisms or parts that at least could be improved in Calvin's Institutes. There are teachings of Calvin, I would say not with regard to the major doctrines of the Christian faith, but with regard to some important doctrines of the Christian faith. There are some teachings of Calvin that I think are erroneous or off the mark or less than a satisfactory explanation of the biblical truth that he is treating. And whenever there is such a, a disagreement, I advertise that disagreement. I do not make Calvin say what I would like to have had him say, but I notify the reader here, one must dissent from Calvin or some such uh, notification mm -hmm. and then go on to explain why I think the Reformed faith in fact should not follow Calvin at that point, but should go in a different direction all those, I don't know if there are that many, but with regard to those instances, they don't all come to mind right now, but I do recall specifically that I didn't think when I was writing this summary, and I still don't think today, that Calvin did justice to the doctrine of the Trinity. Certainly everything he taught about the Trinity was true, 
And that brings up another uh, important uh, aspect of Kelvin's theological work, which I also try to do justice to in the book. A good deal of Kelvin's teachings on various Christian doctrines were necessitated because of heretical denial of those doctrines by men who had personal contact with him in Geneva. That, to my mind, is indicative of the providence of God. God, poor man that he was, Calvin having to engage in all these controversies, I don't think he enjoyed that any more than any of us do, but God intended that the truth should be defended and developed by bringing these heretics into contact with Calvin. He gave Calvin the gifts to discern the truth and to detect the error and to expose the error, and to set forth the truth over against the error. It's as if he handed Calvin one heretic after the other and said, now lay the truth out over against this particular heretic. That's true with regard to Calvin's treatment of the Trinity in particular. Heretics were denying uh, the basics of the Trinity, either the uh, three persons or denying the unity of the being, the unity or the triuneness of God. And Calvin sets forth the doctrine of the Trinity and its truth over against these false teachers. But I think that Calvin didn't do justice to an aspect of the Trinity, and he can't be expected to have seen all of the truth. God left something for those who follow Calvin to busy themselves with, not apart from what Calvin did, but in the line of Calvin. Calvin, I don't think, did justice to this aspect of the Trinity, that God is a fellowship of persons, Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. You don't find much at all in Calvin's treatment of the Trinity concerning the personal fellowship within the Trinity himself, which then God reveals and shares with us in the communion that we may have with him, which I believe is the essence of the covenant of grace, and which we may also enjoy in our fellowship with fellow believers. That aspect of the communion of the Trinity, I think uh, Calvin did not see, and I, I make that gentle observation. I'm hesitant ever sharply to criticize that great man. We owe so much to him, but I don't think he himself would object to that. And But alert the reader to the fact that here I think the Reformed churches could go further and have in some cases gone further in developing the truth. I think that our next author interview needs to be on your work on the Trinity and Calvin. For now then, we'll leave you with the Reformed faith of John Calvin, beautiful book, the book I read first on holiday in the Rockies, greatly enhanced my holiday, and a book which has pleased me greatly too in our bookstore in that it is sold very well for such a fairly heavy doctrinal work of some 450 plus pages, The Reformed Faith of John Calvin.